Hunter Biden's legal problems continue to mount after a judge suspends a plea deal in a stunning move. The judge put the plea deal on hold, reached between Hunter Biden and federal prosecutors. The president's son had agreed in June to plead guilty to two misdemeanor tax charges as part of a deal that would have allowed him to avoid facing prosecution on a separate gun charge. But on Wednesday, the Trump-appointed federal judge questioned the constitutionality of the agreement, saying the deal lacked legal precedent and was not possibly, quote, worth the paper it's written on. During a stunning court session, the judge, Mary Ellen Narico, also questioned the broad scope of the immunity deal, which Biden's lawyers say would have protected him from facing charges on other unrelated issues. By the end of the day, Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to three tax and gun charges. He's expected to withdraw the plea if a new deal can be reached. Ahead of next year's election, Republicans have been intensifying their attacks on Hunter Biden, <clears throat> from his personal life to his multi-million dollar overseas business deals related to Ukraine and China. Last week, the Republican-led Oversight Committee held a hearing where two former IRS officials alleged Hunter Biden had received preferential treatment. During the hearing, Republican Congressmember Marjorie Taylor Greene displayed nude pictures of Hunter Biden engaged in sex acts. Hunter Biden's lawyer has since filed an ethics complaint against Greene for displaying the photos during a televised hearing. Coverage of Hunter Biden continues to dominate right-wing news outlets. As of this morning, Fox News had 12 separate articles about Hunter Biden on its homepage on Breitbart.com. Hunter's name appears 15 times on the site's homepage. We're joined now by Ryan Grimm, Washington, D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept. He recently co-wrote the article, What Does the FBI Have on Hunter and Joe Biden? Ryan, let's begin with what happened in court yesterday. All the news in the morning was a deal was about to be um, sealed. Um, and then this hours-long hearing that ended up in the deal being, well, let's say, stayed for 30 days. What happened and who's the judge? Uh, this is Judge Norica, who is a, uh, an appointee of the Trump uh, administration, but had the approval, the, you know, the, the sign off of both Democratic senators uh, from Delaware. And this is a case where you can say that I think everybody from all sides can say that the judge actually identified problems with the plea deal that do need, that did need to be resolved and worked out. The most obvious one was that the sides didn't actually agree on what their interpretation of the deal was. Hunter Biden's side said that this plea deal meant that anything that the prosecutors had remotely looked into, including whether or not he had uh, you know, violated FARA, which is not registering as a foreign agent, uh, meant that no future prosecutors could ever bring a case against him for those things. That was Hunter Biden's interpretation, and the judge kind of drew that out of uh, his legal team. She then asked the prosecutors, is that your interpretation of this plea agreement? And the prosecutors said, no. That is not our interpretation of the, of the agreement, that if we can find FARA violations, particularly representing this kind of Chinese energy company, for instance, or, or perhaps uh, Burisma, uh, that we can bring that case in the future. So that is an irreconcilable difference. Like, so she, she ordered the sides to work that part out. The other one is the, the unprecedented and potentially unconstitutional part is that they had come to an agreement that rather than the Department of Justice monitoring whether or not Hunter Biden complies uh, with his kind of two years of a uh, non-prosecution for his his gun charge, that they wanted the judge to oversee it because they, their argument was, if Trump comes back into office, Trump would, uh, you know, be reckless and unbiased, uh, reckless and biased and would, uh, you know, bring cases against Hunter Biden in an unfair way. And so it would be better to have the judge overseeing this process. And the judge said, you might have legitimate concerns here, but that's not my role. You know, if you think back to the, the case of you know, the attor attorney, Stephen Donziger, who took on Chevron, there are a lot of problems when a judge starts acting as a prosecutor and the, and the judge seemed to not want to take that present. So she told them to go back, uh, figure, out, figure out the part about FARA, which they actually did sort out in the courtroom. And they agreed that they would not. Uh, and Hunter Biden agreed that he could be prosecuted in the future around FARA violations. Uh, and he said, go back and figure out who's going to oversee this. So it's actually a pretty narrow question. And so if Hunter Biden agrees to let the Justice Department kind of monitor his, his kind of pre-release situation, then 
unless something major happens in the next 30 days, it seems like the judge is going to sign off on this. So let's go to the charges that he pleaded not guilty to yesterday, but was going to plead guilty to when the deal was going to be sealed. Let's. Can you explain what the tax charges are and what the gun charges? Right. So the, not paying his taxes, and he is. <laughs> yeah, everybody's. Uh, let's let's say everybody's innocent until proven guilty. But we know he had huge amounts of income, and he didn't pay any taxes. And this was so. in 2017 and 18. Right. This and uh, this is and this is a time that he has written about in his own memoir as being in, you know in a, on a long drug field bender, uh, and so not the kind not not in a situation where he's keeping kind of diligent books. Money is coming in and money is going right right back out. And the right is has argued that uh, the charge I think is more than a hundred thousand dollars is way too small. That there's that there's enough evidence in the public. That the amount of money that he was bringing in was over ten million dollars, which ought, ought to lead to a, a prison sentence. And there's plenty of precedent, and there are plenty of people who have gone to prison uh, for that those amount that amount of unpaid taxes to say that wait this 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 doesn't seem fair here. The gun charge is pretty straightforward, and I, I would I would wonder if most people on the right would find it actually unconstitutional and a violation of the Second Amendment. But basically, he bought a gun. Uh, and there was a form that he had to fill out that said, you know, are you a current drug user? And he checked no. And, you know, we know from his memoir, uh, from videos that he took of himself constantly, that that was not true. Uh, so that, you know, everybody, like I said, everybody innocent until proven guilty, but he's also guilty of that. So he, we, we know he did those things. But I, I wouldn't find it, uh, you know, surprising if, if you had Republicans say, well, you know what, actually, there, there sh your Second Amendment rights should not be abridged by whether or not you're, you're a drug user. That's beside the point there. So that, that in the plea deal was a, it could be a felony, but uh, is, is uh, you know, he got, as long as he's on, a good, on good behavior for two years, it wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't get a conviction. Um, this is White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre speaking Wednesday. Hunter Biden is a private citizen, and this was a personal matter for him. As we have said, the president, the first lady, they love their son, and they support him as he continues to rebuild his life. This case was handled independently, as all of you know, by the Justice Department under the leadership of a prosecutor appointed by the former president, President Trump. So this is the first time for a president's son. Um, and obviously now this is of major political interest, what's going on. Um, so much so that there was a hearing last week, um, the House Oversight Committee. Can you talk about the significance of that hearing? Many people, like Jim Jordan, are saying, who chaired that committee, um, are saying that this proves that um, that was a successful hearing, because that's what weighed in in the judge's decision. Your thoughts on that, Ryan Grimm? I don't think that that's necessarily the case, because they still have the fundamental problem uh, that KJP mentioned there, that the prosecutor was appointed by Trump. And e even if you have IRS agents who come forward and say, we don't think that this case was brought with the fervor that it ought to have been brought, and we, and we think that there was Did political interference— the the fact that Biden left in place the Trump prosecutor kind of really undermines their case. Now, it, that that hearing did come up, uh, or and and the in the Republican congressional investigations did come up in this long uh, sentencing hearing, or what didn't become a sentencing hearing, because you had this bizarre situation uh, where the prosecutors accused Hunter Biden's defense team of having somebody on their staff call and say they were from a law firm representing the Republicans and asked to have a letter from the Ways and Means chairman taken off of the docket. Uh, the staffer swears up and down that she did not do that, that she that she accurately said that she was from this particular firm and she only wanted kind of uh, publicly identifying information, maybe uh, some tax information, some private information of Hunter Biden's that was in the that was in the documents to be taken off of the public docket, not the entire thing to be taken off the docket. Uh, the, the right has uh, kind of gone nuts with this and is and is calling for the attorneys to be disbarred and is and is making a huge deal of this. Uh, the, the, the judge may kind of, uh, you know, do some type of independent investigation into this. So in that sense, it did get caught up in this. Uh, but the fact that the 
prosecutor is a, is a Trump prosecutor and is still on the case and is still standing behind this plea agreement despite all of the pressure from the right, I think uh, suggests that uh, you know they they haven't quite penetrated yet, but they're not done. You know they they are saying that they're going to bring former Hunter Biden business partner uh, Devin Archer to Congress, who the New York Post is reporting is going to testify uh, that he knows that uh, Joe Biden, the president, or the the who wasn't president at the time but former vice president at the time, you know spoke to a number of Hunter Biden clients, which would undermine the the you know the Biden's claim that Joe Biden was never involved in any business dealing. So they're very much trying to move beyond Hunter Biden, which they understand they've they've kind of beaten that issue to death and trying to move to Joe Biden and trying to link him to some of his deals because they they think that maybe that's the thing that can get this to break out of the right wing cul-de-sac, which has been stuck in. Uh, Ryan, last question, and that is, well, the headline of the piece you co-wrote, what does the FBI have on Hunter and Joe Biden? That was about this this 1023 document uh, that was all that, that was all the rage uh, on the right and that Chuck Grassley has since released publicly. This is a this is a document that the FBI produces when somebody comes to them with information. Uh, you could you could produce a 1023 later today if you called up the FBI and said you had information. It doesn't mean that the information is, is verified, doesn't, and it doesn't say, have, include any analysis or anything else. But what it, So what it was was a confidential human source saying that they had met with a senior official at Burisma, and that senior official uh, said that Hunter Biden was basically shaking them down for extra money, claiming that he was splitting his fee with Joe Biden. Now, the, the problem, you know, you could, even if you believe the confidential human source, which the, the FBI says is a, has been a credible source in the past, uh, you would have to also believe uh, the Ukrainian oligarch. And a lot of Republicans, including even, say, Ron Johnson, have said, you know, we, we're not sure that this oligarch is telling the truth. We're not sure the oligarch is credible. And then you'd also have to believe Hunter Biden was telling the truth to that oligarch, because Hunter Biden could also just be telling them that uh, to use his father's name to get more money out of them. So. It, it's it's a very interesting detail and part of this whole mosaic, uh, but the FBI ultimately found it uh, not not a, a not a credible tip that they could kind of prosecute on. Ryan Grimm, we want to thank you for being with us, Washington D.C. bureau chief for the Intercept. He writes the newsletter Bad News on Substack, and we'll link to your piece for the Intercept.